Hey y'all, today we are about to throw down. Have you ever had delicious buttery sweet potato biscuits? Or how about some garlic and herb mac and cheese? That's right, we're putting a spin on the classics. I have some smothered green beans with bacon and potatoes in a rich luscious gravy. And you know I couldn't leave out some hot honey fried chicken. Baby, are you ready for these recipes? The first thing I'm gonna show you is some hot honey fried chicken. Now I am using four chicken legs, but you can use any dark meat, okay, that you like, cause y'all know I don't be playing with the chicken breast like that, okay, especially when it comes to frying. I'm going to season this generously with salt, pepper, cayenne pepper, a little bit of MSG. Okay, don't tell nobody, but you know it'll make your food taste fire, right? We're then we're gonna add in some hot sauce and then I'm gonna put just enough buttermilk to cover the chicken. We don't need to put the whole dairy farm. We don't need to put the whole cow, okay? You just gotta coat the chicken and that's good enough. Then I'm going to cover this and I'm gonna let this sit at room temperature for one hour. You could also do this overnight, but you need to take it out at least 30 minutes before you fry so that the chicken comes to room temp. Now I'm going to make some seasoned flour. I'm going to go in with about one cup of regular all-purpose flour and then I am going to put in some cornstarch. This is going to help your chicken become crunchier. I'm going to season this generously with some chicken bouillon, some pepper, some more cayenne pepper, a little bit of spicy Cajun seasoning that doesn't have salt in it. You want to be able to actually taste the seasonings in your flour. The only thing I don't really add to my flour mixture is herbs. I find that they will burn on the coating. One of the secrets to some crunchy fried chicken is actually having little bits of flour and buttermilk come together and form clumps. When you press that onto your chicken, those will fry and get really nice and crunchy. So to encourage that from the first piece of chicken, I just put a few drops of buttermilk into the flour. I just form some of those little bits and I press it onto my chicken. If you can see, my chicken has all types of little bits and things on them. That is going to make my chicken extra crunchy, which I personally love. When you are adding a sauce to your fried chicken, like in this case, we'll be adding the hot honey sauce, that can at times make the coating a little bit soggy. Having the coating be extra crunchy before you add the sauce really negates that issue in my opinion. If you have ever seen me fry on this channel, you know that I love frying in my Dutch oven. However, some people requested to see me fry in a cast iron, so I'm gonna show you guys that. Now I'm gonna test the oil with a chopstick and also by putting in a little bit of flour to float. If your chopstick bubbles immediately or if your flour begins to fry immediately, then you know that your oil is hot enough. I sometimes also test the temperature with a meat thermometer, believe it or not. I will be honest with you guys and tell you that my preferred method for frying chicken is not in the cast iron skillet because I tend to find that my coating does not stick as well and also I tend to get browner spots on the chicken. Even though it doesn't taste burnt, it just doesn't come out that golden brown color that I get from frying in my Dutch oven. And so I thought about this and I think the reason is because when you're frying in your cast iron skillet, your chicken comes into direct contact with the bottom of the skillet. Whereas when I am doing it in my Dutch oven, it's pretty much just floating in the oil. So it's always surrounded by the oil. Thus, you don't get those darker spots. Cook chicken legs or thighs for about 14 to 15 minutes and leave them on each side for about two to three minutes. If you are cooking chicken wings, this will take about 10 minutes. Now this is my chicken by the time it was fully cooked to an internal temperature of 165. And I just feel like this is browner than what I'm used to. If I'm doing something wrong or you have some tips for me, please let me know. Once my chicken is fully cooked, I am gonna take it out and put it on the side on a baking rack. I do not like putting it on paper towels because I don't want my chicken to get soggy. If you are cooking multiple batches of chicken, it is very important that you go through and sieve out all of those flour bits. I tend to toss this, but if you're making a smothered chicken, these bits actually would make a delicious gravy. 
For the hot honey sauce, I am adding about a tablespoon and a half of butter to a skillet. I'm gonna melt it over medium heat and then I'm going to put in about two tablespoons of honey. Then I'm going to add as much hot sauce as I like. I'm gonna put in about three tablespoons, but if you want it spicier, you can use a hotter hot sauce. If you want it to be mild, then just use about one tablespoon. I'm gonna mix this together over medium low heat and then for an extra bit of flavor, I'm putting in a sprig of fresh rosemary. Adding in a clove of garlic would also be delicious too. And I'm gonna let this simmer and infuse for just about two minutes. Then I will remove my rosemary sprig and you will have a delicious and easy hot honey sauce. I'm gonna take each piece of chicken and I'm just going to toss it in the coating. Y'all ain't nothing like some candied fried chicken. <laughs> Y'all, this is not good for you at all, but this is delicious. You can't have this every day, baby. You can't have this every day, okay? I like to use a brush just to gently coat all of the sides because when I tell you every, you gonna want this in every single bite. That little rosemary just adds that great herbal flavor. Oh my goodness. When I tell y'all this chicken is finger licking good and it is super juicy, honey. I literally, I literally bit my tongue eating this chicken. I was embarrassed, I, my tongue started bleeding. I was like, I'm so glad no one's here to see this. And yet I'm confessing to you all. After you coat your chicken with this sauce, you are going to want to eat this right away. If you let this sit too long, it is going to become soggy. So make sure you have your other side dishes already prepared. Do y'all see the inside of that chicken? Baby, baby, are you gonna make this? Mm, Jesus. Have you ever had a delicious, moist sweet potato biscuit. Baby, I'm gonna show you how to make them today and they are delicious with some honey or some maple syrup or just on their own, but they're definitely perfect served with some fried chicken. Now, the first thing I'm gonna show you guys is how to properly measure the flour. I went in with a spoon and I just fluffed up the flour because it's generally pretty compact. Then you want to spoon it into your measuring cup. This is really important. If you don't weigh your flour, you need to do this. This is one of the reasons why many people's baking recipes come out dry. People just stick their measuring cups straight into the compacted flour and they end up accidentally over measuring. You can use a knife to knock off the excess flour and if you need to do an increment that is not one cup, then spoon your flour into the measuring cup and then just shake it. Whenever it gets to the line, like I'm going for a two thirds measure, that is when I will know that I have enough flour. I cooked a sweet potato in the microwave for about seven minutes. You can also roast the potato as well. I typically don't boil the potato because I don't want the excess water. Then I am going to use a fork to go ahead and start mashing the potato and break up any strings. You want one cup of mashed sweet potato. Ideally, you should roast two medium sweet potatoes or one very large potato. However, I decided to make up the one cup measurement with some leftover candy yams that I had in the fridge. I just made sure not to include the extra butter that was surrounding them and I mashed them until I had one cup. I stuck this sweet potato mixture in the fridge for about 30 minutes until it came to room temperature, or you can even bake your sweet potato the night before so that it would be cold. Into a large bowl, you want to add your sweet potato mixture and half of a cup of buttermilk. Use a whisk to thoroughly combine these together until they are well combined. Then in my food processor, I am going to be essentially making some biscuit flour. So I'm putting in that flour as well as three tablespoons of sugar, some cornstarch, a little bit of salt, and baking powder. And I'm going to beat this on low until it is well combined. I have had a stick of butter that I cut up in the freezer for about one hour. This is unsalted butter. I am going to pulse this on low until I get about pea-sized pieces in my flour, but you can also use a pastry cutter. But honey, if you got the food processor, baby, you better use it. Grandmama would have used all these modern appliances if she had it. So go ahead and take advantage of it. 
Where the majority of people mess up their biscuits, it is when they start to handle the dough. A lot of people will overwork the dough and it will lead to dense and flat biscuits. I am going to use a spatula to mix the flour and the sweet potato and buttermilk together until it is just combined. It should look very shaggy, something just like this. Now on my cleaned counter, y'all, this counter has been wiped, okay? I am going to add some flour so that my batter does not stick. I am going to gently and also quickly knead the dough. I am going to show you guys every step so that if you are new to this, you can make sure that yours looks just like mine. So make sure you pay careful attention. As you can see here, I am going to be folding the dough onto itself to start to collect some of those crumbly bits. This is not like bread where you need to you know, continuously knead it. When it just comes together, it is good enough. As you work the dough, add a little bit of flour whenever necessary. I am going to pat out my dough until it is about three fourths of an inch thick. And then I'm going to add some flour to a knife. I'm gonna cut my dough into three parts and I'm going to stack them on top of each other. This is how you get layers. When you stack and have flour between them, that will create little layers in your biscuits. I'm going to gently pat out the dough again until it's about three fourths of an inch thick one more time. I'm going to add flour onto that top layer and I'm going to cut it into thirds again and then restack. If you look closely at the side of my dough, you will see that there are some layers that have already formed. Also, you will see little pockets. Those are those pockets of butter and you want to see that. When the butter melts in the oven, that is how you get those flaky, buttery biscuits. Once you have flattened out your dough to about one inch thickness, then we will start cutting out the biscuits. I am using a standard biscuit cutter. I believe it's about two and three fourths of an inch, and I am going to flour it. One trick to getting layers, you need to press straight down and come up. Do not twist the biscuit or else you are going to prevent it from rising. If you look on the side, I'm sure you can see that there are layers there. That's how I know that my biscuits are going to rise well. I'm going to be able to press out about two really good biscuits from this first set of dough. Then I'm going to take out these biscuits, I'm gonna set them in my cast iron skillet, and I'm going to gently press the dough together in order to start cutting out the rest of the biscuits. Now, if you've been watching me for a while, you know that I often like to just do some square biscuits and I will do that in a, you know, in a minute, okay? I love to do that most of the time, but for the YouTube, okay, I'm gonna cut out some biscuits. Once I have worked the dough a few times, that is when I tend to want to add in another layer just to make sure that the biscuits at the end are not too dense. So I'm going to flatten out the dough again and then I'm going to cut it in half and then restack it and press it out just to put in another layer because the dough has been handled so much. Then I am going to be able to cut out two more biscuits. First this one and then I'm going to press it together and then I'll be able to cut out one more and then the last one I'm just going to form together whatever is left. Now that biscuit is going to be ugly okay but it's going to taste good okay so I'm going to still eat that biscuit all right. For the size of biscuits and the thickness that I chose, I got seven biscuits. However, if you make them smaller or a bit thinner, you can get anywhere from eight to about 12. I am going to cook this in a 425 degree oven for about 25 minutes. The top should be golden and they should be cooked through. If they are brown before they are cooked, simply cover with a little bit of foil for about a minute or two and continue cooking. Mine cooked for 25 minutes and when they were out the oven, I immediately brushed them with a little bit of maple butter. One thing about sweet potato biscuits is that you do not want to eat them right away. They need to cool for about 10 to 15 minutes or else they are going to be a little bit gummy. This is because the sweet potato adds so much moisture. But if you allow them to cool for a bit, they will have the perfect crumb. They are buttery, they are moist, they are delicious, and they don't have an overwhelming sweet potato flavor. Let me know if you're going to try this. 
I know that there are many macaroni and cheese purists out there. They will tell you that macaroni can only be done one or two ways and it's probably their grandmama's recipe. Today I'm going to show you a garlic and herb macaroni that is simple but is a little bit different and it tastes great. I have already cooked my pasta and drained it and now I'm going to melt a tablespoon and a half of butter and combine that with a tablespoon and a half of flour. I'm going to toast the flour for about one minute stirring it continuously. For the garlic and herb, I'm going to add about a half of a tablespoon of my green seasoning mixture. This is going to add a light herbal and garlicky flavor that is not going to overwhelm this pasta dish, but it's just gonna complement the cheese. Then I'm going to put in one full can of evaporated milk and stir and whisk this until all of the lumps are out. Honey, you, you got to work out them flour lumps or else your cheese sauce is not gonna come out right. Now to add some more garlic and herb flavor, I'm going to put in one block of Borson garlic and herb cheese. I love this. This tastes so good in macaroni. You can also use the shallot and herb one. That will be great as well. The cheeses, don't think too hard about it, honey. You really just need to think about ratios. I cooked eight ounces of pasta, so I need one pound of cheese. You wanna double the cheese in proportion to the pasta. As far as varieties are concerned, you can never go wrong with using a cheddar cheese. However, I had some pepper jack, so I threw that in there. White cheeses like mozzarella tend to be milder, so you definitely need to have some sharp cheddar to balance it out. The only type of cheese I say you don't wanna to go too crazy with is a smoky cheese, like a smoked Gouda. Though Gouda is really good, a smoked Gouda has a strong flavor, so I tend to not use any more than about two ounces of that cheese. Once all of my cheese is melted, I'm then going to add some simple seasonings, a little bit of Cezanne, Vegeta, pepper, garlic powder. You can just do this to your taste, and then I am going to mix that in. I like to add the Cezanne just to give it a slight orangey color. Now I'm going to add in my pasta, which was boiled in a little bit of chicken broth, and I'm gonna mix this together until it is well combined. At this point, you can taste your macaroni and see if you need to adjust the flavor or the thickness. To me, this had the perfect amount of ooey gooey and I was ready to bake because y'all know my preference is to always bake my macaroni. Now I have a baking dish that I have greased with a little bit of butter. I'm gonna add in my macaroni and just spread it down with my spoon and I'm gonna top this with about six slices of Munster cheese. I always love to use deli cheese for a topping because it is just so much easier than having to shred it. I'm gonna put on a little smoked paprika and I'm gonna put this in the oven at 375 degrees for 20 minutes or until the top is golden brown and the sides are nice and bubbly. When my macaroni is done, I'm gonna take it out and let it sit at room temperature for about 10 minutes before serving. This is going to allow it to set, but y'all, I know you see this. I know this looks so delicious. Are you guys going to try a little variation on your classic macaroni with a little bit in garlic and herb flavor? Let me know in the comments how you feel about this. I really love this mac and cheese and everyone who tried it loved it. Let me know if you are going to try this recipe. Now I am going to show you how to make some smothered green beans and potatoes. While this could stand on its own as a meal, it is absolutely perfect paired with some rice, some cornbread, a little fried chicken. Baby, you gonna be eating, eating. Now I'm not a big fan of snapping no green beans. Y'all already know, you know, back in the day, grandmama had a garden and she'd have you sitting on that porch snapping green beans all summer. All right, but I'm gonna do it today. You can snap your green beans into smaller pieces, but I like to just leave them whole. I'm also going to be dicing half of a white onion and I'm also going to prep some potatoes. One thing I love about the South is that down here, we can take any vegetable and pretty much any cut of meat and make it something that can be smothered with a nice gravy, okay? You can take green beans, potatoes, squash, Y'all, we will cook 
all types of meats in a rich gravy. Let me know what are your favorite cuts of meats and vegetables to smother. Some of my favorites are lamb, chicken, and these green beans. So once I have peeled and cut off the bad spots of my potatoes, I'm gonna just cut them into about one inch size pieces, and then I'm gonna put them in some cold water. I'm gonna rinse off some of the starch, and I'm going to, of course, add <laughs> a little bit of that pea Piggly wiggly. Now, if you don't do the pig, okay, you can do turkey bacon and then you can add about three to four tablespoons of butter in order to make the gravy. I like to cut the bacon pack in half. It just makes it easier for me to get the bacon that I want. And then I'm gonna cut these into about one inch strips. With the rest of the bacon that is left, that is perfect for me to air fry and use on burgers because it is already small. I have been heating my Dutch oven over medium heat. I'm gonna put in my bacon and allow it to cook until it has rendered its fat. If you don't want so much fat, you definitely can scoop out some of the bacon fat, but of course you want to save all of the meat because we're gonna add those back into the green beans. When they have rendered their fat, I'm taking out the bacon and I'm going to place it to the side and I am just going to leave all of the grease in the pot. All of those little brown bits on the bottom, well that is flavor baby, okay. Now I'm going to add in my onions and I'm going to saute them for about three to four minutes until they are translucent. And then I'm putting in a tablespoon of flour. I'm gonna to toast the flour for about a minute, continuously stirring because you don't want it to burn. This is what's going to help thicken up that gravy. Then I'm going to put in three cloves of minced garlic and cook this for about 30 seconds. At this point, your kitchen is going to be smelling amazing. Then I'm going to put in all of my green beans as well as some chicken broth, but you could also use water and then put in some chicken bouillon. I'm gonna add just enough chicken broth initially until I can just start to see a little gravy form and then I'll end up adding more later with the potatoes. To season this, I'm using some garlic powder, smoked paprika, Creole seasoning, a little bit of pepper, and I just like to do that to my own taste and then I'm gonna mix this thoroughly so that all the flavoring you can just get all up in them green beans. I'm going to cover this. I'm going to allow this to simmer on medium low for about 15 minutes. At this point, my green beans are tender, but they are definitely not falling apart. I'm going to add in a little bit of chicken bouillon because I felt like the flavor was just lacking, okay? A little bit of crushed red pepper flakes and mix this in. Of course, you can just season to your own taste. Now I'm gonna add in the rest of that chicken broth. Because I'm gonna put in some potatoes, I don't want the gravy to get too low because you know potatoes just be sucking up. They just be sucking up some water, okay? So I'm gonna add in these potatoes and I'm gonna allow this to simmer until they are fork tender. This is going to take about 15 to 20 minutes depending on the type of potato that you have. I don't like to let this go too long because I'm not, I'm not making mashed potatoes, okay? Now that my potatoes are ready and I've adjusted the seasonings the way I like, I'm gonna throw back in that bacon. And y'all, this is when I just feel like everything comes together. You have the crispy, salty bacon, the creamy potatoes, a rich gravy, and then some delicious green beans. Paired with rice, the sweet potato biscuits, hot honey fried chicken, macaroni. Baby, I'm getting excited just thinking about this meal. Oh my goodness, you guys know that I I love you and Jesus loves you. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.